the Holy Gospel according to John 20, John 20, 19 through 29. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Judeans, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed him his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they had seen the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and put my finger in the mark of the nails, and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us. So I've always felt kind of bad for Thomas. You know, he got left out when the big event happened. Maybe he was out getting groceries or something. You guys send me out, and of course, I missed it. I hope you at least took some selfies, pics, or it didn't happen. And then, to make matters worse, Thomas has to sit with the sense of missing out, not just for a day or two, the text says, but for a week, a whole week. And he kind of has this attitude of, nice story, guys, but I'm not really buying it. I'm going to have to see it to believe it. And in a way, who can blame him? Yet he forever gets a bad rap, right? He becomes doubting Thomas, the disciple who missed out, the disciple who didn't measure up. But how do we know if any of those other disciples would have responded differently, right? He just happened to be the one who wasn't there. And so many of us have been taught that doubt is a problem. Doubt is bad. You don't want to be like Thomas, do you? And after all, Jesus says to him explicitly, do not doubt, but believe. And the takeaway we're left with is, doubting is bad, believing is better. Well, turns out maybe it's not quite that simple. For one thing, you really can't just believe your doubts away. If you've tried, let me know how that went. And if you try, I think in many ways you're setting yourself up for disillusion. The writer Madeline Langell says, Those who believe, they believe in God, but without anguish of mind, without uncertainty, without doubt, and even at times without despair, believe only in the idea of God but not actually in God. Or sometimes we believe in the idea of believing. Another writer puts it this way, a faith without some doubts is like a human body with no antibodies in it. If there isn't any room for doubt, if you haven't listened and sat with your doubts, then when a crisis or tragedy comes or some hard questions, your faith could collapse overnight. So if we don't make space for doubt, perhaps we're setting ourselves up for trouble. The theologian Paul Tillich said, doubt isn't the opposite of faith. 
It's an element, a part of faith. And Anne Lamott went further. The opposite of faith isn't doubt. It's certainty. Because if there isn't any doubt, then what need is there of faith? Right? If you already know, then at that point you just know. And there, we're not talking about faith at that point. And it turns out that doubt is an indispensable tool in staying alive. If you said, I believe I'm a safe driver, so I don't need to wear a seatbelt. That wouldn't be the best idea. Better to doubt both your own ability to drive perfectly safely and everyone else around you, right, who you can't control. So better to have a little doubt about getting from A to B safely than put on that seatbelt. And researchers have studied the importance of doubt in keeping us from believing everything we're told, in which case we could be taken advantage of, right? Advertisers would have a field day if we just believed everything we were told. We need a healthy amount of skepticism to keep from buying every product that promises us instant happiness, a perfect body, a perfect career, a perfect life. And what these researchers found is that people who had suffered localized damage to an area of the brain called the ventromedial prefrontal cortex, that's VMPFC for shorthand, these folks were less likely to practice healthy skepticism or doubt and more likely to be taken advantage of by advertisers. Which means that part of our brains is hardwired to doubt. So doubt is a part of being human and essential to helping us learn and grow. Some years back, a member of the National Coalition to Abolish the Death Penalty was demonstrating against an execution in Alabama. And he was holding a sign that said, Jesus was executed. Well, it turned out there was someone else protesting in favor of the execution, which feels like an awkward thing to protest for, but they were there. And this person was a good church-going person and saw this sign that said, Jesus was executed, and he took issue with it. And so he comes over to the guy and he says, Jesus' death really wasn't an execution because it was the will of God foreordained for our salvation. And so what can happen is that we so theologize Jesus' death that we can forget, yeah, he was executed by the state. Paul Nuchterlein says, this is what Paul meant by the cross being a scandal. It's so hard for us to face what Jesus experienced that we want to cover over his death with a comfortable myth. Which brings us back to Thomas. I'd always assumed that what Thomas was doubting was the reality of the resurrection. But what if he's doubting something else? Remember what he says, unless I see the mark of the nail in his hands and put my hand in his side. What if Thomas isn't doubting the resurrection but the crucifixion? What if he's doubting the fact that God would raise someone from the dead who had been executed in utter shame? That puts this story in a slightly different light. Again, think of the disconnect of this churchgoer who was in favor of capital punishment. By believing that God needed, maybe wanted Jesus to die, planned for Jesus to die, we imagine that God needs violence to accomplish God's purposes. And if God needs violence, well, then our violence is okay too. What is harder to believe for both Thomas and all of us is that God is not only not using and affirming violence, but the opposite. 
showing us the triumph of the way of peace and love and nonviolence. And you could argue that the violence done by a few in that single moment in history to Jesus reflected not just the few Roman soldiers who were actually doing the deed, but the violence all of humanity has believed in and committed, including ourselves. And yet God forgives our violence and shows us a better way. And so the doubt in question on our story perhaps isn't so much about the resurrection per se, but that the way of peace has truly triumphed, that the crucified one has been raised. And what we are invited to doubt is that our way of violence is the only way. And what we are invited to believe is that Jesus' way of peace is the better way. But of course, all signs point to us believing and doing the opposite. Instead of doubting our violence, we believe in it more strongly than ever before. Instead of understanding that words written hundreds of years ago may need to be updated to make sense today, we instead imagine that the Second Amendment is more sacred than Scripture itself. And when more school children get shot up, or folks simply going to the bank, or vacationers relaxing on the beach, the answer again and again in this country isn't to doubt the sacred right of violence, but to double down on it. The answer to gun violence, we're told repeatedly, is more guns. We need armed guards at every school. We need armed teachers. We even should be armed at church. Well, this all-pervasive belief in the power of weapons to save us from other weapons reminds me of the story of a village whose leader had an accident, hurt his legs, and needed to use crutches to get around. Well, it turns out that he took to the crutches quite well. He gradually developed the ability to move with speed, even to dance and do impressive little pirouettes for the entertainment of his neighbors. And he liked the crutches so much that he took it into his head to train some of the children in the use of crutches. And it soon became a status symbol in the village to use crutches. Before long, everyone was using crutches. And by the fourth generation, no one in the village could walk without the use of a crutch. The village school included crutchery, theoretical, applied in its curriculum. And the village craftsmen became famous for the quality of the crutches that they produced. Well, one day, a young man who'd been reading some, quote, dangerous books, presented himself before the village elders and demanded to know why everyone in the village had to walk on crutches since God made everyone with two good legs to walk on. The village elders were amused that this upstart should think himself wiser than they, so they decided to teach him a lesson. Why don't you show us how, they said. Agreed, cried the young man. And so a demonstration was fixed for the following Sunday at the village square. Everyone was there. The young man hobbled in on his crutches to the middle of the square, stood upright, and dropped his crutches. Well, a hush fell over the crowd as he took a bold step forward and fell flat on his face. That day confirmed the belief for everyone that, in fact, it is quite impossible to walk without the use of crutches. When you believe something long enough, it is hard to imagine another way. But there are signs of hope. Signs that people are beginning to doubt the conventional wisdom and believe that there is a better way. When we see students showing up to state legislatures chanting for peace and for real gun reform while singing this little light of mine, there's reason to hope. When lawmakers are willing to join the protest, even at risk of losing their own positions, there is reason to hope. And when a state like our own 
which has done nothing on this issue for four decades, now has elected officials brave enough to pass at least modest gun reform. There's reason to hope. When folks like Shane Claiborne are melting guns into garden tools, we might begin to believe that the old words of the prophet might still have some life, that they shall turn their swords into plowshares and study war no more. Because it is time that we doubt our conviction that violence is the way. It is time we doubt that more guns will make us safer. It is time we doubt our unshakable belief that our worship of weapons has anything to do with following Jesus Christ. It is time we stop doubting peace. We, like Thomas, need to see again the mark of the nails and put our hands in his side to remember that Jesus submitted himself in love to our way of violence and has shown us that it is hollow. He shows up in our midst, arrives as we cower behind locked doors amid our lockdown drills and our doubts that we could ever really be loved and forgiven and safe. He arrives still bearing the scars of our doing and says, peace be with you. That is something I want to believe in. Amen. Maybe so.